This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, Greg, for the very low pressure introduction. <laughs> Expectations are not too high. It's great to see all of you. It's great to be at Dynamic Walking. It's my first meeting, and so it's really, it's really nice to see movement from a very different perspective from the one that I usually think about. So it's been a, an interesting experience in that sense. So I'd like to talk today about kind of some of my work on skeletal muscle, but really in the, the broader context of where I think the field's at at the moment in a, a big picture kind of way, and how we can apply that to the more kind of robotics modeling side of movement. So skeletal muscle is really our biological motor. It gets a signal from the nervous system, and it uses chemical energy in the food that we eat to turn that into some kind of mechanical output. So we get this conversion of chemical to mechanical output, and this really, it's our interface with the world. It interprets what our nervous system tells us to do, and it turns that into something in the world. So everything from how we move, how we interact with our environment, how we communicate with other people, all driven by skeletal muscles. So it's this kind of really central component of animals. And as a muscle physiologist, I'm fundamentally interested in how these molecular level, tiny contractile proteins acting in myosin, how they ultimately produce all the movements we see across all animals and humans. So that's really my focus, and I think there's a lot of fun in like poking around in here and working out fundamentally how do muscles work. But this area of research also has some pretty big applications, and the most obvious ones in this context are that if we have a good framework for understanding how muscle works, under a variety of conditions, we can really get good models of muscle contraction and we can model how animal movement works. And if we want to replicate movement, so if we want to generate movement from scratch, it's a pretty good place to start looking for examples of how to do it. So this kind of idea of modeling and generation of movement are things that we're pretty good at. If we can find a willing animal that will let us stick stuff to them and measure things, we can take measurements of what muscles are doing. We can integrate these with simple models. This is called a hill-type muscle model. It's kind of our basic model of muscle contraction. We can stick these things together into kind of big picture, how does a whole organism generate force and move? And we can get some pretty complicated simulations of movement. And we've really used these kind of simulations of movement for all kinds of things. They're a very broad field. They've really advanced our understanding of movement. We can look at what's the best way to cycle? What's our nervous system trying to prioritize? What does a clinical condition look like? And what might happen when we treat it? They're you know, really predictive models that we use to do a lot of different things with. And so we've gotten pretty good at this muscle modeling. We've also gotten pretty good at the generation of movement. I feel like it was kind of easier to make fun of robots a little while ago, and it's getting a little bit harder, which is unfortunate for me, because that's kind of where I'm at. But we're getting pretty good at generating powerful, controlled movements that might even be slightly smug sometimes. You know, we're really getting there in terms of generating movement. So we're pretty good at these things, but we're far from perfect. If we look at our simple model of muscle, this is something that's pretty hard to validate. We do a lot of this modeling movement because it's really hard to take these measurements. But when we can, and when someone goes to the trouble of doing that, this is the force that this model predicts over a bunch of strides from, I think, a goat running on a treadmill. This is data from Sabrina's, Sabrina Lee's lab. So we get these predictions of force. If we compare them to what we actually measure in the black, it's not always an awesome fit. They don't work particularly well. And this is kind of important. If we're using this model to decide which kid gets a surgical treatment for cerebral palsy, I want this to be a little bit better than this, really. So there's lots of room for improvement. And while we're really good at generating movement, it doesn't always work that well. Sometimes I'm also really scared of actually doing this, having shown you this video, so I'm going to try and not fall off the edge of the stage. But we've got kind of a long way to go and things that we could definitely improve on in terms of our generation of movement. And so, really, I'm here to talk about how we can use physiology to help inform these kind of fields. And in terms of these musculoskeletal models, 
it's pretty obvious. If we have a better framework and a kind of simplified, distilled framework for understanding muscle, we're going to get better predictions. In terms of generating movement, it's not as obvious. I feel like we were really into accurate biomimicry a little while ago, and maybe we're still doing some of that, but I think we're realizing some of the challenges as well. So when we're using an electrical motor to power movement, does it make sense to act like a muscle? I don't know, we'll see. I think there's things we can learn and things that are, are maybe not worth the effort. But if we think about muscle as a thing that powers movement, it's a really good thing to try and replicate. So we can do all kinds of things. It's so versatile. We can climb, we can jump, we can pull adorably cute faces while jumping. <laughs> These monkeys are amazing. They just run round and round in a cycle, jumping back into the pool. <laughs> It can power all kinds of locomotions. We've got snakes moving, we've got a slightly concerned looking iguana, slightly threatening looking snake. And then it does anything from that facial expression to this powerful acceleration. Really good over uneven terrain, unstable locomotion. This video, I don't know if you've seen this video, it's from Animal Planet, it's kind of traumatizing. The iguana gets wrapped up in the snake, and, but it escapes, it's okay, it's all fine in the end. So we've got lots of different kinds of movement. We can power hovering flight, we can swim like the Xenopus in a tank, and we can even produce sound. So if you look at this tree frog, it's vibrating its abdomen at like 100 hertz, and we're powering all of these things with skeletal muscle. So while knowing a bunch about muscle physiology might not have the direct, most direct link to generating new movements, it's not a terrible place to start looking. So I want to kind of come back out now and come back to muscle physiology. And I want to start by giving a little bit of a history of muscle physiology, because I think it's pretty relevant to the way in which our understanding has developed and kind of where we've gotten a bit stuck at this point in time. And it's pretty amusing. So I think the first and possibly one of my favorite physiology experiments is this one by Galvani in the late 1700s. I was really born at the wrong time for doing muscle physiology, because this is a dead frog that he's got from somewhere connected to a lightning rod, which is probably one of the better muscle physiology experiments. Um, and so in this experiment, he's simultaneously showing that it's electrical impulses that excite muscle and make the frog twitch, and also that lightning is the same thing as the stuff we're turning light bulbs on with. So it's a, a very multifunctional experiment. So this is really our first example of muscle physiology. Prior to this, the best descriptions of it were animal spirits create movement of some description. So this was a pretty big step in our understanding of muscle physiology. And I'd like to say we've come a really long way, but this is a bit what my lab looks like. We have a frog, we take some muscle out of it, we electrocute it, usually with the electricity from the wall rather than the sky, but we're still doing pretty similar experiments trying to work out how muscle works. So super early on, we've got this idea of electrical activity exciting muscle. Our next big step really then came from the field of biochemistry. So we isolated in Hungary, mid-war, behind some iron curtain, like this was very kind of separate from the world research. But we isolated these proteins, actin and myosin, and they're what we now know is kind of the molecular motor in muscle. But we really identified these as major components pretty early on, and that really kind of drove our understanding of muscle. So we've got these proteins, and a few years later, we started using light microscopy to look at muscle. So if you look at a muscle cell under a microscope, you see this banded pattern. We've advanced our technology a little, and if we can look under an electron microscope now, we can see much more detail about that banded pattern. And what this showed us is that these proteins that biochemistry had shown existed are organized in this very regular arrangement. So we've got these individual proteins existing as strings. This is actin filaments and they're interdigitated with these myosin filaments. So we've now got some structure. So we've got electrophysiology, biochemistry, through to microscopy, really telling us about the structure of muscle. And from this, we inferred a mechanism of muscle contraction. So we worked out that actin and myosin, in response to that electrical activation, are interacting. The myosin head is binding to actin, 
It undergoes some force generating cross strokes. This is a cross bridge between actin and myosin, and it generates force by moving through this change, and then the whole thing resets. And this process is driven by that chemical energy from food, so we hydrolyze ATP, and we've got a means by which we turn chemical energy into mechanical. So this is really our motor. Down at a molecular level, this is what's providing force and work output. And this arrangement of, of contractile proteins and this mechanism of generating force, I feel like at this point, this was like 1954, we're like, we're good, we got it, we work this out, that's great. We then did a, a bunch of experiments to try and kind of verify these theories. And there's lots of predictions that we can make from this kind of motor. So if we have a motor that looks like this, it's going to have some properties. And we can kind of think of this as being analogous to an electrical motor. We have a constant power. So we get this relationship between the force or the torque it can generate and the velocity. We have some kind of properties of our muscle as a consequence of how the motor works. And so the same is true of muscle. If we think about it being this relationship between overlapping contractile proteins, we get some relationship between its force and length. At some intermediate length, we've got the best amount of overlap. At longer lengths, we've got less overlap, we've stretched those proteins out, we can have less of these cross bridges generating force. At shorter lengths, everything starts interfering and we get less force again. We also see a force-velocity relationship, and we think of this as a consequence of the kinetics of this cycle. As we're moving these proteins past each other faster and faster, they get less able to generate force. So we did these experiments, saw these properties, and we're like, we definitely got this. We are very sure about how muscle works. It has these inherent properties. And really, the kind of field of trying to link muscle physiology up to animal movement really went from there. We were like, OK, we know how to do this. And so if we think about these properties and we think about a joint moving, as we flex and extend the muscle's changing length, it's going to move around this force length curve. The faster we do that movement, we're going to move along this force velocity curve. So we really took a lot of our understanding of what animals look like and how they organize and use their muscle kind of from these principles. And so we said, OK, so we have these long tendons that attach to muscle so that these can do all the moving and the muscle can stay pretty constant and we can have high forces. And we interpreted the, like, lots of the complex anatomy we see in muscles. This is a, a fish showing organization of muscle fibers in this kind of complicated spiral way. And we think we kind of interpreted this as if you're bending your body, your muscle fibers change length a lot, but if you have this spiral pattern, you manage to stay in a good region of that force length relationship. So our early muscle physiology kind of really went hard on these properties in terms of interpreting animal structure and function. But one thing that I found particularly surprising and surprising that we maybe hadn't thought more about was the kind of incredible spatial scale that we're operating across here. So these cross bridges, when they do one movement that generates force, they move just less than 10 nanometers. Tiny, tiny movement, molecular level movement. And we use that to power an organism movement. If I'm swinging my leg, it's moving maybe five, 10 centimeters. We've got this kind of on the order of five million times amplification of movement from our molecular level motor up to our organism. If we compare that to like something that feels a bit more real, this is the difference between me doing a sprint versus going to the moon. It's like this really huge spatial scale that we're operating over. If we compare it to a, an engineered system, we've got a car driven by a piston engine. We have a stroke of a few centimeters. Through our transmission system, one revolution of the wheel gives us a displacement of about a meter. We've got a 20 times amplification. So the point being that we really don't tend to engineer systems over this kind of spatial scale. And yet, it's what we seem to do so well with in biology. So what are the consequences of this? And the spatial scale is, is cool, but the stuff that we have in the middle of that spatial scale looks a bit like this. It doesn't look like the most, well, depends on your perspective. I don't really much mean, but <laughs> it doesn't necessarily look like the most exciting or most appealing thing. They are made out of meat. Meat? Took them aboard our recon vessels and probed them all the way through. <laughs> 
They are completely meat. It's impossible. Well, who made the machines? That's who we need to contact. Meat made the machines. It's ridiculous. So maybe not the most kind of exciting seeming tissue that we're, you know, impressed it works across this spatial scale. This short story is really awesome. There's lots of anecdotes about making meat sounds when you're talking. <laughs> but so we've got, this, we've got this big spatial scale that we're operating over. And a lot of what my research and some of the broader field generally is focused on is really what's in the middle of these levels. So we know we've got our, our contractile proteins, and I want to kind of now run through what that spatial scale looks like, and then some of the functional consequences of it. So what we understand kind of better about what's in between these scales. So we've got our contractile proteins, and they're arranged into these filaments. We've known this for a long time. What kind of advancing biophysics techniques have really given us is that these filaments aren't rigid, especially actin exhibits pretty significant compliance. It doesn't undergo huge deformations, but if we're thinking about the purpose of this protein being to bind to another protein, that stretching can really change how likely our motor is to bind and generate force. So it has some pretty important functional consequences. So we've got this kind of mechanosensitive motor, and it's how well it works or how much force it can generate depends on the loading conditions that it's under, which is maybe pretty important to how we're going to use muscle during movement. We've then got these proteins organized into this regular sarcomere kind of arrangement. It gives us this beautiful pattern, but there's so much more going on down there. There's these proteins, but they need to be held in some kind of framework. So we've got these stretchy proteins in the middle of a sarcomere. We've got nebulin, this yellow protein that kind of acts as a ruler to set sarcomere length. We've got a bunch of proteins holding and modulating function at the ends of the sarcomere. But maybe one of the most important proteins that are involved in this kind of structural arrangement is this blue protein in here, which is called Titan. And this is a, a molecular spring, so if we apply some force, if we apply some force, we can stretch it, it can bounce back, which is interesting in itself. We've got kind of a compliant link at a very small scale. But when we turn the muscle on, when we activate it, we get a big jump in force, that, or a big jump in stiffness of that Titan. And we think it's because it binds to actin and becomes a stiffer spring. So we have this variation in our intramuscular springs based on activation level. So we've got kind of more complexity. If we keep scaling up, we stick these sarcomeres end to end. We get this beautiful striation pattern that we see under the microscope. And we've got these organized and held together with a bunch of intermediate filaments. We then get up to the muscle fiber level. And this is essentially a cell. So we've got a bag that's full of water. We've put a bunch of contractile proteins in it, but it's still a bag full of water, and that gives us some properties. If we take a cross-section through the muscle and we digest away all the muscle tissue, we're left with this kind of skeleton framework. And we refer to this as the extracellular matrix. Oh. So we can think of our muscle fibers as being wrapped in this extracellular matrix. So when they want to contract and shorten and our muscle do work, it's got to deform this extracellular matrix. So we're working against some kind of springy tissue. And if we look at the properties of this tissue, it's got a pretty nonlinear relationship between force and length. So we've got more structural elements at a higher level that are resisting muscle shortening and bulging, so potentially influencing how much work they can do. We keep on going up, we've got muscle fibers arranged into bundles. Again, if we take a cross-section of the muscle and digest away the muscle fibers, we've got this kind of beautiful honeycomb connective tissue structure. So we've got more and more layers of those wrappings, and they all exhibit these nonlinear stiffnesses. Keep on scaling up, we stick all these muscle fiber bundles together with some geometry. And this geometry really varies a lot. Whenever you look at a piece of meat that looks kind of different, it's a different geometric arrangement. So if we look at something like the pectoralis muscle of a bird, something that's really powerful, it's powering flight, it's just got these muscle fibers running straight, end-to-end, -end, generating force and work in one direction. If we look at something arguably more complicated, like an octopus tentacle, if we look inside that, we've got fibers going around in a circle, we've got fibers going at an angle, we've got fibers going straight, and we've got something that functions as a muscular hydrostat. 
So just by arranging these kind of simple elements in different configurations, we get really different functional properties. And then lastly, we connect these fibers to some large connective tissue sheets. So if we look at this frog muscle, we've got a big sheet of aponeurosis that wraps around the muscle, and then a more kind of rope-like tendon that ultimately connects it to the skeleton. And again, these have some stiffness, they're springy, collagen is almost a, well, it's as good a spring as we get in biology, it's not particularly viscous. So we've got this kind of stretched relationship. If we look at the, the shape of this, if that muscle bulges when it shortens, we're going to stretch the aponeurosis in that direction. We're going to get a different stiffness. So we've got this muscle spring stiffness that also depends on dynamics. So we've got kind of all of these layers going on in muscle. And so between our molecular level motor and our organism, we don't just have this huge spatial scale. We're not just operating over a big spatial scale we're not using the kind of rigid transmission system that we commonly see in engineered systems. We're seeing something that's ridiculously compliant and viscous and all kinds of other things. So we have a lot of complexity in between those levels. And so we can kind of think of that as like a weird motor that's properties depend on it being stretched. These motors being connected with springs and dampers, most of the proteins at this level are pretty viscous. We get connect them by these activation-dependent springs. We have springs going in the other direction between fibers. We keep on scaling up and up. We then wrap them in a bunch of springs operating in different directions. And then we stick a spring on the end, because why not? So we've got this really complicated system. And I think when we look at it like this, there's a lot of why. Why is that a good way of organizing this? I feel like from very simple engineering principles, maybe not from more complex principles, like this is like, it's so lossy, it's so unpredictable, there's so much going on there. But this seems to be the solution biology is converged on. Does it have any function? So what I want to transition to doing now is looking at some of the kind of more emergent properties of muscle. We've talked about these kind of our 50s muscle properties, where we're like, okay, we know what our motor's doing, this is how it's gonna behave, to what does all of this other stuff do? What effect does that have? And is it important to movement? So one of the kind of first areas, and I think this really speaks to like, I can see that, it looks interesting, that we looked at was we started looking at tendons. They're big, they're right there. We started looking at what the effect of these structures might be. And so, Tom Roberts, who talked a few years ago, has done a lot of work on the role of tendons, so I just kind of want to briefly summarize that and then move on. But we've known since the early 80s, and this is another of my favorite experiments, where you take a cadaveric camel leg and you squash it, and you see that the tendons stretch, and you see that it's kind of the same magnitude of forces as you'd see in a running camel, so we know that these tendons stretch and recoil during movement. And then work from Tom's lab has shown us that in high power output systems, so like this frog jumping, we get a power amplification. So the muscle stretches the tendon, and then the whole thing recoils like an elastic band and catapults that frog. And so we get power outputs that go from maybe a few hundred watts per kilogram up to something like a thousand, which is not you know, off the order of what we might see in engineered systems, but it's a pretty big improvement for an animal. In level running systems or hopping systems, in the case of this wallaby on a treadmill, we see tendons acting as energy storages and returns. So they take the energy of the body, they store it in the tendon, and then they give it back to us. And this really lets us have kind of small muscles with reduced volumes and low costs. So we're really bringing down the cost of our motor. And more recently, Nikolai has shown that if you drop a turkey in a harness, turkey's very safe, you get this transfer of the energy from the body, first to the tendon, so you get a really rapid stretch in the tendon, and then the muscle stretches more slowly and it prevents damage. So on a big scale, we've got these structural elements helping to amplify power and give us high power output movements, save metabolic energy and make us cheap, and to prevent muscle damage. So big scale, we've got some kind of helpful properties from our structural elements. I think what we're starting to move more to now, and this is, really speaks a lot to improvements in techniques in biophysics that let us make small-scale movements, is looking more at what's happening down here at the sarcomere kind of protein level. What interesting emergent properties might we get out of this? And so we've got all of this complexity. Does it do anything? <laughs> 
And one of the, the properties that I think is, we kind of are starting to get a pretty good handle on this, is we had this idea of a force length relationship where at one sarcomere length, we had the best overlap. And this presumably translates to there being one mu muscle length that's the best length. Great, we know which muscle length we want to operate at. We're going to set up our whole biological system to keep our muscle around this length. Except if we let our muscles shorten to that length and then contract, we get less force out. If we stretch our muscle out to that length, we get more force out. And suddenly, we've got all of this variation in the force our muscle can produce at a given length. And we're not totally sure on the mechanism on this. We're still working on it. We have a couple of good possibilities. The first of those is this idea that you can stretch out those contractile proteins. So if you turn your muscle on, you generate some force, you stretch those contractile proteins, then you slide the proteins past one another, you're kind of operating with a motor in a different state. You've got a motor that has very different binding and force generating properties. So this is one good potential. The other is this molecular spring, Titan, where if we turn the muscle on, we stick Titan to actin, and then we slide those filaments past one another, we're going to get different force contributions from this Titan spring. I don't think these are mutually exclusive. I think there's a good chance they complement one another by kind of changing the stiffnesses of each other. But these structural elements give us this history-dependent phenomenon. What our muscle's doing now depends on what it did last time. And for a while, this was kind of, we somehow treated this as like an abstract curiosity about muscle. Until you think about what a muscle's doing in an organism, so this is a, a small generic flying insect. If we take a cross-section of that and look at its thorax deforming as its wings move up and down, we get this stretching and shortening of the muscle and generation of force in each wing beat cycle. So everything our muscle is doing in an organism is subject to some history. It's got something that happened before and something that happened now. So we're always experiencing these history-dependent effects. And a, a bunch of work out of Monica Daly's lab at the RBC has looked at what we think might be a really important functional consequence of this history dependence. So if we make a guinea fowl run over a drop that it can't see, it's pretty good at self-stabilizing. And if we just play that again. As it goes down that drop and comes back out, its muscle is going to undergo a different pattern of stretch and shortening. It's going to experience a different history. And so we're going to get a different force out of it. And a lot of the work that Monica's done has shown that this is really important in kind of giving us preflexes or intrinsic muscle properties and improving stability. So we've got this kind of good property coming out of these structural elements. On a slightly bigger scale, if we move back out, we have lots of effects of muscle, of aging on muscle. This is entirely how I'm hoping to look in 10 or 15 years' time. <laughs> But we have lots of effects on muscle age. And the two kind of properties I've talked about previously are structural elements of muscle doing good things for us, making us powerful, making us stable. If we think about aging, we definitely get some changes in these contractile proteins. We don't have as much actin and myosin. It doesn't work as well. But where we see really big changes is those connective tissue wrappings. We get a lot more of that connective tissue around muscle and it gets much stiffer. We've got a much stiffer environment in which our little kind of bag of fluid muscle is working. When that muscle tries to shorten, it's going to generate higher pressures, which are potentially going to limit the force it can produce in the other direction. And we're going to have a reduction in the amount of work it can produce. It's not going to be able to shorten as far. So in this case, we've got structural elements doing something, but they're not particularly adaptive. They're potentially making a problem of aging worse. So it's not like everything structural elements do is great, but it has a lot of consequences. And so these, these three kind of areas, changing the kind of energy storage in tendons and looking at stability and then looking at aging, are things that we, we understand pretty well. We're at least starting to get a handle on how some of these complex components of muscle interact with one another. One area where I think we're kind of starting to move towards and where a lot of my research has been is looking at changing muscle activation and what this does and how that relates to that kind of motor structural property relationship. So we said at the beginning, by electrocuting frogs, we can get muscle activation. 
This is probably the like, crudest way of activating a muscle. We tend to do it through the nervous system. Oh. And if we want to change the force output of the muscle, so if we want to apply more force to our bike pedal, we essentially turn up the activation of our muscle. So if we take this cross section of a muscle, we've got some muscle fibers and the nerve that innervates them. We're sending impulses down this nerve to activate those fibers. If we want more force out, we turn up the number of impulses or we turn up the number of fibers that are active. So we can get this really finely graded variation in force. If you think about the kind of subtleties in the way in which we can go from standing to a slow walk and balancing and then sprinting, we're really totally dependent on this kind of variation in muscle activation in a really controlled way to move. So we know it happens. We've known since the 20s that it happens. What we're essentially doing is we're changing the number of cross bridge motors that are active at any given time, and so we're changing the total force out. But if we now think about that in terms of kind of this framework of muscle, not just being actin and myosin, but being this whole array of complex tissues, what we're essentially doing when we're turning activation up and down is we're changing the number of motors that are active, but we're leaving all of those structural elements constant. So this very physiological principle of changing muscle activation to do different things means that we're really fundamentally changing the relationship between the molecular motors and the structural elements. We're changing the number of motors that are active, so we change the effect that they have on those structural elements. And this is a, an area that we've started to do some work in, but we haven't quite got to the end of the story yet. But I sort of want to give you where we're at and some of the potential implications of that. So maximally activated muscle, and this is how we did how we still do 99% of muscle physiology is we zap it as hard as we can because it's easy. And we get these force length and force velocity properties out. This is how we got them in the first place. When we start to turn down the activation, weird stuff starts to happen. We get a shift in that force length relationship. So we get this drop in force that we'd expect. We turned our muscle down a bit. But we now get a different length at which it likes to operate. And if we think about this relationship as being an amount of overlap between proteins, that's not something we should predict. If we look at the relationship between force and velocity, we get a decrease in the maximum velocity our muscle can shorten at. And so when we do something that's entirely what muscles do during movement, we get huge shifts. And these aren't small differences. These are like 40% differences. It's not, a, it's not a small amount. And if we think about how much we base our understanding of muscle off these relationships, and you're like, oh, it just moved 40% when I did something that was realistic, you start to get a little concerned. So we get big changes in those relationships, and that's kind of one of the, the main things that I've worked on recently. What I'm looking to work at in the fairly near future is thinking about how this change in activation changes our chemical energy consumption. So we're trying to establish a thermal imaging system so this is a, a heat map of a muscle. As it generates force, it also generates heat as kind of a byproduct. And so we can calculate how much chemical energy the muscle's using. And we know there's a relationship between efficiency and velocity. And this is a, another parameter that we kind of try and um, set how we understand muscle around. So is muscle operating in a way that it's efficient? We have no idea what changing activation does to this relationship. And there's good kind of theoretical reasons to shift it in both directions. So maybe it stays in the middle. I don't know. But there's really good reason to think it changes a lot. And then if we think about some of those springs that muscle's operating against, as we change this relationship up and down, we're going to operate in different regions, so operate against different compliances. If we think about our proteins deforming and changing their motor properties, we're going to deform them to different degrees at different activation levels, and we're going to get different changes in how our motor works. So we've got all these potential effects of activation level that really kind of screw with our understanding of muscle as we, as we thought it was. And we're still very much in the process of working out what the implications of these things might be. But one of the big things that I think is important about these structural elements changing properties with activation level is how we think about motor control patterns and how we think about how we use muscle to do different tasks. So 
my artistic skills are limited to giving our person on a bike a single muscle in their upper limb. Works for some purposes. So we've got this muscle generating some force to move us forward. If we look at the actual anatomy of the upper limb, we've got this hugely complicated, many different, relatively synergistic muscles doing the same kind of thing across the hip and the knee joint. So we can think of having kind of a lot of redundancy. We have a lot of different options. If we simplify that down to two muscles, because that's actually the limit of my artistic abilities, we've got these two muscles generating force. The two muscles do pretty much the same thing, so we could activate them in lots of different ways in order to get the same output. We could turn both muscles on the same amount and get some force. We could turn one muscle entirely on and leave the other one entirely off and still get the same force, or any combination of in between those and still get the same mechanical output. So we have what we think of as being this really big redundancy in how we control muscle activation patterns. And traditionally, we've thought of this very much from the control side of it. How does the nervous system want to control that? Do we distribute activation equally across muscle? Do we distribute it so we get the same force? But all coming from the idea of how do we distribute activation and what's the nervous system doing? If we think about all of this non-linearity that we have, muscles are better at some lengths under some activation conditions. Velocity pretty much always drops. Maybe efficiency changes. The compliance that we're operating against changes. So I don't think we're totally wrong to think about this from a nervous system controls perspective, but I think there's also kind of an effector perspective. How does muscle operate at different activation levels? And does that kind of influence how we want to recruit different muscles to do a simple task? So I think it's kind of thinking in a broader scale about how muscle is operating under very dynamic conditions. OK, so we've got our complicated muscle arrangement crossing this huge spatial scale that's giving us a bunch of interesting emergent properties. It's making us powerful, it's making us stable, it's making us not move as well as we get older, potentially, and it's probably doing something to how we recruit a set of muscles to do a given task. So it's, it's doing a bunch of things. Muscle is not just actin and myosin, it's this whole complex structural organization. I promised, how does this relate to modeling and generation of movement? So I want to kind of come back to that now. We've got an idea of how complex muscle is, and it's not just benign complexity, it's complexity that has functions that are important for movement. So what can we do with this in terms of how we think about predicting and modeling and generating movement? So in terms of our muscle models, we're, we're doing, I say we, other people, are doing a good job of incorporating some of this structural complexity into our muscle model. So at the moment, our hill-type model, our kind of go-to muscle model, takes these force length and force velocity properties, plugs them in, and tells us how much force our muscle could, should generate. If we think about just even the shifts that we saw in these relationships with activation level, we start to understand why that model's 50% wrong sometimes. Like, we see really big errors in it. So this has been our go-to model. We've started trying to do updates to this to incorporate some of this complexity. So Kisa Nishikawa and her group have uh, introduced this winding filament theory that we saw a talk about this morning. So really what we're doing here is we're, we're introducing this Titan element as a spring and a damper. And we're introducing a pulley to kind of represent that Titan potentially wrapping around actin, and so having all of these complex history-dependent effects. So this is kind of one start point. It looks pretty similar to a hill-type muscle model, but we've put some of that added complexity that we think is important in there. We've got work going up at, on at UW by Tom Daniels Lab and mostly Dave Williams, looking at these like beautiful, big-scale, spatially explicit models where they're modeling all of the protein interactions in a muscle, and they're trying to look at a lot of this kind of complexity in actin and myosin. So how does that deformation affect motor binding, and how does that play out across a whole complicated muscle? These are really fun. They're also really computationally expensive, so it's kind of a, a very exploratory thing. At, in James Wakeling's lab, they're trying to use finite element models to do this. So what they're really getting at here is taking muscle fibers, and giving them hill-type properties, so kind of using our simple muscle model, 
And then sticking those muscle fibers within a base material. So sticking it inside a material with some properties that replicate some of the kind of mass and inertia and viscosity and resistance to deformation that our muscle might have. So we're really making some inroads into these. They have different levels of potential application to big scale modeling, but I think they're interesting in terms of how well do we understand muscle and can we get better force predictions out. In terms of generating movement, a little less obvious, but we're starting to see some success. This is the cheetah robot. And so either in the hardware or through the controls, we can start to introduce some of those compliant or damped elements. And we see pretty fast economical movement that's maybe moving more towards the kind of locomotor competency of an animal. So we're starting to see on a, a kind of pretty big scale some of those elements being introduced into muscle. So we're making inroads into kind of relating muscle complexity back to our modeling and generation of movement. Do we really need to? Is this like really a good idea? I really like fussing around in the small details of muscle, but if we want to build a system that moves or we want to build a whole body model, we probably don't want all the fine details. So in fact, I've had a bunch of conversations this week that have said, can't you just tell us what the important emergent properties are and we'll take the ones that we want? Absolutely, that would be awesome. That's a great place to start. I think it has a, a lot of benefits. It also informs our biology as to what's important and what can we get rid of. But these things aren't simple emergent properties. I can tell you, we have history dependence. What your muscle does now depends on what it just did. But it's length dependent, it's velocity dependent, it's force dependent and so are most of these other properties. They're not particularly continuous, and they change in ways that we don't totally understand yet from the biological perspective. So while we could just kind of start shoehorning these properties into our models and our robots, if we can get a better understanding of the physiology, so if we can get a better understanding of what's driving these emergent properties and how they show up, it seems much easier to actually introduce that perspective. So if we take the Titan example, and we, our winding filament model does much better than a hill-type muscle model, can we use that? And it should give us the right emergent properties under all movement conditions. So it should give us a, a better functional output than just kind of trying to push these discrete phenomena into our models and into our robots. And then we can make awesome robots like this. This is my favorite robot. <laughs> this is my favorite robot because it's not distinctly different from how I look trying to do this. <laughs> so with that, this really is a, a group effort. I'd like to thank people for helpful discussions and stealing data and loaning me figures. And so that's hopefully kind of some picture of, of where the field of muscle physiology is up to and what we can do with the big concepts from it rather than kind of fussing around in the details. Uh -huh. Take any questions. Wonderful to have you here. Welcome to Pensacola. <laughs> you know, Einstein was right. It's all about energy, and all energy has a frequency. What is the frequency of the human nerve impulse? That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> okay, next question. What is the extracellular material made out of? Uh, that one I can do. So it's mostly collagen, which is this thing that's very much like a spring. So a lot of biological tissues will stretch them. They'll kind of recoil. They'll lose a lot of energy. Collagen is very spring-like, and then it's in a matrix with proteins and kind of ground substance and water. So it's a very kind of stretchy, springy tissue. One of Dr. Ford's keen interests is helping senior citizens not fall. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas how to, in, how to isolate and then exercise quick twitch fibers so seniors can prevent falling? So specifically fast twitch fibers, yep. Um, so the musculoskeletal system responds in a way that um, gets better at doing whatever you're trying to do. So if you want more fast twitch fibers, sprinting or very rapid movements is the best way of achieving them. Um, if those are not technically feasible for whatever reason, one of, the, one of the things we're really looking to is if you lengthen a muscle, so if instead of lifting a weight, you let a weight lower 
we actually get much higher forces out of muscles. So that can be kind of a, an easy way to train, so kind of resistance eccentric training by lowering your weight instead of lifting it. At the, the very extreme and potentially slightly unpleasant end of the spectrum, um, you're totally right in terms of nerve impulses, and nerve impulses vary with fiber type. So theoretically, it works in a dish. It may work in a person. If you were to stimulate muscle with very high frequency electrical pulses, higher frequency than you might normally expect, you'd expect to see more fast twitch fibers, but it's probably a little uncomfortable. So I'd go for eccentric training maybe rather than electrocution. <laughs> Um, you might have just touched on this, but how does muscle structure change when you work out and get stronger? Um, mostly it doesn't. You just get more of it. So you get bigger muscle fibers and you get more muscle fibers. So you're getting more and more actin and myosin, but you get relatively similar kind of structural organizations around it. And that's, that holds pretty true up until about your mid-30s maybe. And beyond that, if you don't exercise, you start getting more of those connective tissue wrappings and less actin and myosin. If you keep exercising, you tend to keep muscle that has a structure that looks more like young muscle. And that's true up to about 60. After that, everyone's muscle structure starts to change, but there's a, a kind of good period of time in there where exercise has a pretty big influence on muscle structure. Uh, I am wondering, it's fascinating to understand the structure of a muscle, mm -hmm. but is it possible for us that don't understand biology to consider it a black box mm -hmm. and using enough experimentation to derive its properties and thus assume a better actuator or try to understand mm -hmm. how to build it? Yeah, and that's definitely... Um, one of the, it was at one point a modeling slide and then it got removed, as to do we just take all of the animal data and the human data that we've collected, put it into some black box and it spits out what a muscle is going to do under any given situation. And I think that's theoretically a good way of going about it. One of the, the big problems with it, and it's the same as like just taking those emergent properties and trying to put them into our muscle model, is that we only understand what we've been able to measure. If we don't understand the basic mechanism, we miss things. So we have a lot of muscle data for animals running at a constant speed on a treadmill. And maybe that's enough, but I think a lot of what we know about movement is that that doesn't show up a lot of the interesting properties of muscle and kind of intrinsic stabilization. Um, there's maybe a move towards collecting muscle data under more unsteady conditions but it's pretty hard to get good data. So I think we still have the same problem of it's definitely worth a try, but we're probably still going to miss some pretty big aspects of it by using that kind of approach. So uh, I, I was interested in this idea of history dependence. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the history-dependent effects of muscle to some extent explain why we see a lot of oscillatory repetitive motions like flapping and running in biological systems as opposed to like engineering systems? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it... It's a question of like how did which came first, <laughs> which <laughs> it's definitely useful in flapping and oscillating systems. Most biological movement is repetitively moving some kind of appendage. So in that situation, it's really useful. One of the maybe better examples that illustrates that is in, so tiny insects have super high wing beat frequencies, like up to a thousand hertz. They've transitioned muscle fiber type, so they never, during flight, they never turn muscle off. It just stays on, and it generates more and less force entirely as a consequence of history. So they're powering movement entirely by history dependence, not just using it to get themselves out of a pothole in the way that mammals are. So I think it's um, definitely very useful in those systems. Which came first is a, <laughs> a different question. Thank you. So uh, many engineering softwares are using hill type model, as you know, and you suggested that hill type model is not that accurate, and you also mentioned the Titan uh, is adding the Titan in the model is good. And so do you suggest us using that or? Um, I suggest using a variety of them for a while while we're working it out. Like I think we're still in the stage of putting elements into models that we think are physiologically important and then testing them out. I think if people want to use different models in their simulations and kind of compare results, that would be great. One of, the, one of my biggest concerns about using the hill-type muscle model is it's, you know, there's errors. There's errors in every model. 
Because of the way in which the hill-type muscle model isn't great in that it's entirely based off molecular motors and nothing else, it's not just wrong, it seems to have the potential to be pretty systematically wrong. So if you, you kind of take the example of uh, muscle properties changing a lot with activation level, hill-type muscle models are based on maximally activated muscle and they work okay at kind of higher speeds. If you turn down the activation, your, muscle, your model gets worse and worse as you turn down the activation. So if I'm trying to compare someone walking and someone running, my model's got potentially different levels of error between those conditions, so that's kind of my, my biggest concern with it. So I think it's, it would be great to start exploring new model types and kind of maybe quietly leaving the hill-type muscle model behind. <laughs> Slowly, but... Yeah, so you, you, you mentioned this um, issue already in terms of talking about insect muscle, that it has these properties that vertebrate muscle does not have. Mm -hmm. um, and even when we're comparing something like a frog versus a human, that's mm -hmm. 100 million years plus of evolution mm -hmm. at work. Mm -hmm. So how can we generalize, to, I guess to what degree can we generalize from properties of, of, of one system to another system, for example, a frog to a human, mm -hmm. and how do we get around that, any problems that can mm -hmm. I think this is, so for a, a long time, the kind of intro comparative physiology has been, apart from insects with really high wing beat frequency, muscle is pretty much the same in everything else. And that's somewhat true, it has very similar actin and myosin, they're arranged in a pretty similar way, we have, similar kinds of structural elements, at least, that connect it out to the skeleton. I think one of the, the really interesting areas that I think would be really fun to do in muscle physiology is more comparative physiology across these structural elements. So, does Titan change? We know that connective tissues are stiffer in human muscle than in frog muscle, for example. So, how do we get functional differences by tweaking those elements? Um, I think in terms of evolution, it's not, um, we're not necessarily evolving to something. So if you, there's a, a really fun paper on frog jumping. So you, frog is very like back end and front end. The back end pushes and the front end breaks in a way that's pretty rare in an animal. And if you look at the properties of hind limb and forelimb muscles in the frog, you see pretty big differences in terms of one being very compliant and able to do a huge amount of work and the other being stiffer and more of a break kind of muscle. So not so much in an evolutionary context, but certainly in a functional context, there's a lot of differences. And I think those differences are interesting in terms of how do we want to tweak our models or our generated systems in order to do our task better. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Like among the many things you discussed, uh, one, of them you. That, uh, one of them that you didn't touch upon was muscle fatigue. Mm -hmm. like, can you just tell us a bit more on like what's the current state of understanding on like why does muscle get tired or like why do we lose energy? And the second part of the question is like, is it, do you think it's necessary to include muscle fatigue in simulation models? Mm. Uh, yeah. That's a, a great question and something that I'm very bad at thinking about when we're doing isolated muscle preparations. People talk about doing work on fatiguing muscles, and my answer is always, your muscle's dying, it's not fatiguing because it's in a bath. But in terms of mechanisms of fatigue, we certainly see kind of buildup of metabolites, so inorganic phosphate from the breakdown of ATP. If we're working our muscle at a higher rate, then we can get oxygen to it. We switch to types of metabolism that don't require oxygen, but do have kind of buildup of byproducts that cause pain. Um, and so all of these things will decrease force production and probably change the kind of energetics of crossbridge cycling, so it almost gets less efficient as you go on, which is unfortunate. Um, so there's lots of aspects of muscle fatigue. Um, in terms of increase in adding those to simulations, I think for a, a lot of activities, it's probably... Um, there's probably several steps that I would like to introduce before fatigue for a lot of healthy activities, but in the same way as changing activation level makes your model worse, if you're working with a clinical population, so say stroke survivors who we know fatigue very rapidly and can't perform for long distances, then the kind of how muscle performs in a fatigued state is probably much more relevant. So I think in, 
in certain contexts, it might be one of the earlier things you want to add to a muscle model, but for kind of healthy, young movement, I would add other things first, I think. So uh, when you originally kind of started your talk, you were saying that it might not be worth it to uh, base kind of mo or motors off of muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and like your figure that you showed with all the complexity kind of was a great reason why. However, when you look at something that has like a five million times transmission ratio, mm -hmm. that's also pretty great. Uh -huh. um, and so if, if you're not necessarily particularly keen on taking the muscle route for maybe like a new version of motors, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that maybe either like maybe new materials and things of that way are a better way to go and create new motors or it might be worth it when compared to that to um, look at muscle physiology and really try to get all that complexity to make new motors or both of those are trash and there's something <laughs> else that we could be doing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, um, there's many different answers to that question and probably we're going to try some version of all of them. Um, part of my reason for saying I'm not sure that like we're working with such kind of bait, like as the systems stand at the moment, they are so different. Is it worth trying to get all the way back to a molecular scale motor or can we do something better with the kind of fabrication that we currently have? Um, I think having a molecular scale motor gives you lots of room for these emergent properties that biology seems to make good use of. And so, yeah, we could go totally down the biomimetic route. If someone can fabricate a nanoscale motor that lines up in series and parallel with a bunch of other nanoscale motors, and awesome, we can make a muscle, and we know that that works pretty well for a diversity of movements. But I think that uh, by having a, a better framework for understanding muscle, and so having a, a more fundamental understanding of how some processes result in some outcomes that we use, we can maybe shortcut some of that complexity of trying to go all the way back to a molecular scale muscle. Um, there's all sorts of arguments about energy dissipation and scalability that a molecular scale motor is really good for. There's a, I saw a, it's a dielectric elastomer, does that sound right? A kind of substance that changes shape and it looks a lot like a muscle when you put a current through it. That has some of the kind of viscous properties and some of the deformation properties and so kind of dynamic shape change consequences that a muscle might have. So as we get a better framework for knowing what's important, some of those materials might start to come into their own more as having properties that we've identified as useful. And so I think they're a, an interesting way to go. Uh, thank you for the awesome talk. My question is sort of similar to the previous one. Uh, so there's a lot of people in this room that are building robots that interact with humans, like prosthetics and exoskeletons. Mm -hmm. And we usually look at the motions and the forces that the joints create, but I'm wondering what kind of benefits could we get by looking at what the muscles are doing instead of bigger picture joint level things? Mm -hmm. Is Daniel here? So uh, Daniel Riviera, who taught today, has a, a great just kind of handshaking robot that people interact with. Um, super simple, but driven by different muscle models. And I think one of, the, um, one of the big things that we're seeing from that, and it kind of matches with where our muscle models perform particularly badly, is we sometimes get kind of reasonable peak force outputs. So we get like a force that could generate the movement that an animal would. Um, but we see a pretty different kind of time course of force. So the, the kind of engineered or model systems quite often give us a, a nasty spike in the beginning. And it, so I think in terms of robots that we interact with, if we want them to feel more human-like, a lot of those kind of damped and forced ramping over activation properties are pretty helpful in creating something that feels biologically realistic, if that's the thing that we want to do. It's like a forced transience, I guess, are the big, the big difference. Okay, we have maybe time for two more questions. One right here. So I think a lot of the talk has spoken about what properties of muscle are useful for movement. Mm -hmm. But do you think there are properties of muscle that are in detriment to movement where you're like, if you're an engineer, you're like, oh darn, I wish the muscle didn't have this. <laughs> get rid of that bit. I want to get rid of that bit. Um, I think a lot of them are a, a compromise if you have a very versatile locomotor system. Um, if we got rid of, and frogs have done this to a big extent in the hindland muscle, got rid of a lot of those connective tissue wrappings. You could have a muscle that would shorten way further. We would have a much higher power density from our muscle. 
something's probably going to get damaged in that process, so we have kind of a hard limit on how big of a length change we can undergo. Um, so anything I would get rid of. I'll keep thinking about it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, so I haven't seen a lot of references on this, but I read somewhere that um, in animals, muscles have like um, a spectrum of functions, so they're not just actuators, they could be like brakes or a strut mm -hmm. or things like that. So um, I feel that like engineers, with me being one, uh, for <laughs> most uh, part, they have looked at muscles as actuators, mm -hmm. so the drive of the movement. So how much do you think is important to explore those other functions, and uh, is it actually important or not? Um, I mean, if you have an actuator, you can go. If you want to stop, you need a way of stopping. Muscles are pretty functional brake as well. Um, so I think if you don't want to use other systems, if you want the thing that you are actuating with to do everything, then it needs those other properties of muscle, certainly. Muscle is also a length sensor and a position controller and all that, like we have a lot of sensory and motor integration in this one system and in the, the same way as is it worth building a molecular scale motor? Is it worth building an actuator that has all of those functions or do we just pass them out into separate um, pieces? Is an interesting kind of what are the, what's the feasibility of fabricating something like that and what's the benefit trade-off we get? I think are all interesting questions. All right, let's thank Nellie for an amazing talk.